all of these little white dots here. Nathan Grubaugh is standing in front of a sequencing machine at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. So this is where all the magic happens. For a paper coming out this week in the journal Nature, he and his colleagues used machines like this to decode dozens of Zika virus genomes. Their samples came from Florida, where Zika began showing up in mosquitoes and humans last year. The virus has been linked with birth defects in countries like Brazil. The team's goal was to find out when, how, and why this virus first came to the U.S. And they knew these genomes could reveal a lot. So we can track which each little piece of DNA, where that came from. Grubaugh opens his laptop and pulls up a file full of sequencing data. It looks like a big Excel spreadsheet, overflowing with A's, C's, G's, and T's. He points to one highlighted column. That some of the viruses have a G there and some of them have an A. Those small genetic differences tell an important story. They're mutations that actually show how the Zika virus changed over time as it spread to new locations. I could quickly tell if it came from Florida or some other place. Grubaugh is the first author on the Nature Study, which shows that Zika mostly came to Florida not from South America, but from the Caribbean. He and his co-authors conclude that Zika came to Florida at least four separate times, likely through busy travel routes connecting Miami with popular Caribbean destinations. It could be like Bahamas or U.S. Virgin Islands and such because it, it makes sense. There's a lot of people that go there to vacation and come back or, or Jamaica or Puerto Rico where you have a lot of family members. These findings are just now coming out in a scientific journal, but a very similar version of this study has actually been publicly available for months. The day the researchers submitted their study to journals, they also posted it to a website called BioArchive. And this was posted on February 3rd, um, now months before it actually will hit mainstream press. And Grubaugh says long before that, they were posting their raw data online in close to real time. We can go from sample to having data online in five to seven days. Grubaugh is just one of the many scientists now choosing to get their research out in the open long before it's formally peer-reviewed and published in a journal. They say this approach can make science more transparent and nimble, given that publishing in a journal can take months. And because other researchers can comment on their early findings, they say it can actually enhance peer review. Back in a quiet office, I asked Grubaugh why he and his colleagues decided against the more traditional approach of closely guarding their findings until publication. There's an epidemic happening, and it's, it's wrong in a way to withhold information from the rest of the world that could be beneficial to helping to slow down to prevent Zika virus infections or for other researchers to use what you find to apply to their own work. Grubaugh is a postdoc in Christian Anderson's lab at Scripps. Their lab website has a section where they post their data. It's labeled secrets. So it's just a, a joke that we just make all of our secrets publicly available. But the joke gets at a serious point. In some ways, scientists have an incentive to keep secrets. They can make their careers by publishing big new findings in a top journal. Some might worry that if they share their data too widely, competing scientists might use it to scoop them. Grubaugh says that's an old-school mindset, and his team's experience shows that just the opposite can be true. By posting on sites like Twitter, GitHub, and NextStrain.org, they were able to make helpful connections with other researchers. Instead of competing, we decided, let's combine our data sets together. And, um, and then you see people that know how to analyze our data in different ways, or have other sorts of data, like the travel data and the mosquito abundance data, and said, hey, we have this stuff too, maybe this could help your story. One thing most scientists still avoid before publishing in a journal is talking with the media, which is why you end up with stories like this one, talking about new studies that are technically not that new. In fact, there's a chance that the next big new study you hear about is already online now, if you know where to look. David Wagner, KPBS News.